Hey, how's it going? I'm Nick, and I'm your host on the Echo Academy podcast, a podcast dedicated to uncovering helpful tools and strategies to help elevate your career. On today's episode, we talk about how to get out of your own way and be successful. My guest today is Mei Ping Lim. Mei Ping is the founder and leadership coach at Gotta Ping. She coaches young executives and entrepreneurs to navigate complexity and effectively lead the way to create sustained success in tomorrow's world. To find out more about Mei Ping, her work, and this episode, visit echo.academy forward slash Mei Ping. That's E-K-H-O dot A-C-A-D-E-M-Y forward slash M-E-I-P-H-I-N-G. So without further ado, here's my interview with Mei Ping Lin. All right, Mei Ping, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. So today's topic is really on like how to get out of your own way and be successful. Mm. But uh, for me, I personally feel there are two parts to it. Mm-hmm. Number one is um, really how to understand the, the type of work we do and the amount of work that, mm-hmm. that is given to us yeah. or the amount of work we give to ourselves. Yes. And then after that, what are the things that are actually hindering us from being successful? Mm-hmm. So I want to dive deeper in those two things. Mm-hmm. Um, so I suppose my first question, and uh, if if we were to just get straight mm-hmm. to it, is really to understand how do we even identify the work that is necessary versus the work that's just busy work that may not be so relevant. Mm. Yeah. The first question is that if you find yourself asking, how should I do something, then it's a really busy work. Right, because it's action based, isn't it? And I think, I think we all want to feel productive when we are taking action. But I think the question here is that: Are you taking the right action? Right. Yeah. So the better question to ask is: Why is it important? What are you? Why are you doing what you're supposed to be doing? Because I find that um, a lot of people want to take action very quickly, even before they really understand the objective and purpose. But you just want to get started because I think we have been, uh, we are in an environment whereby the faster person who does it, you know, wins the race or whatever. Yes. Um, but I think sometimes it's really helpful to really slow down. I always say, you know, go slow to go faster. Right. Yeah. And that's that's interesting. But at the same time, I also have questions about that because um, sometimes I feel that we are not conscious of the mm. fact that we are doing busy work. And yeah. I'll give you an example. Let's say, um, you know, you're, you're a salesperson. Mm. I think that's an easy example, I guess. <laughs> uh, just you're a salesperson. Yeah. You think, you know, you if you make the a certain number of dials mm. and calls, you should be getting, you know, the proposals out and mm. closing deals. Yeah. But... That's because everyone else does that, right? <laughs> so by definition, you would think that that's, yeah, I don't know, necessary work. But, <laughs> you know, how do we kind of differentiate and understand like what's working for us and what is just yeah. extra work just because other people are doing it? Yeah, definitely stop looking outside of yourself. Just because it's working for someone, it may not necessarily work for you now. So that person may be at the level eight, for example, but you are baby steps, right? You're probably at the level two. So comparing one to one, I think sometimes um, demotivates you and makes makes you potentially feel like you're doing the wrong thing. But it could be you're not at that step yet, right? One other thing I found very helpful is to run my day by objectives. So what are the two things that you should achieve today? Versus here's a to-do list of 10 things that I must strike off. Yeah. So uh, sometimes it's quite controversial when I tell people I don't buy into this whole to-do list idea because um, not everything, not every task or activity is equal, right? Just because an item is number two on the list doesn't make it more important than um, item number eight, for example. So it's about, again, understanding what are you trying to get out of it? So what is the ultimate goal of a salesperson is to sell to 
a, the aligned client. So the client that that person can help most with the product or what is, what is um, for example. So if cold calling, cold calling itself may not be a bad strategy, right? But my uh, aimless cold calling probably is a problem. Yes. Just because you want to hit that 400 calls a day um, without maybe first identifying who's your target market, who can you help, are you, do you have their contacts? Are these the people you are reaching out to? Because that 400 calls to the right clientele may reap more rewards, right? Then that's just the minor adjustment of like, are you pitching it correctly? Are you sharing your product um, as accurately as possible and so forth? So it's different tweaks, I would say. Right. Yeah. So it's almost working backwards from the mm. objectives. Yes. Okay. So why <laughs> why specifically are you against to uh, yeah well you're not against to do <laughs> but isn't to do a to do list a means to an end to mm. fulfill your objective? Yeah, I found that most people don't really know what their objective is to begin with, and sometimes it's so much more convenient when an idea or a task pops up in your mind, you just list it down, and later on it goes into a rabbit hole, right? Because the more you listen, they're like, oh, I can't finish this. And then you start your day so overwhelmed. And after a while, you also forgot why that item made that list to begin with. Right. Um, of course, having clear activities that you want to, you have to do for the day is very helpful. Um, so to me, it's back to what is the ultimate objective. And today, if you can only, if you need to achieve that objective, what are some of the actions that you can take? And you, you will find that it, broadens your creativity also because it's not just two things that you can do to achieve a similar objective right there could be many methods but ultimately what is your goal right so it's just finding the most efficient mm. way to fulfill your objective yeah rather than just having a to-do list that to strike things off to get to your objective yeah i find that some people have that high you know when they strike off and they say oh yeah, I've, yeah i'm so productive and then but come the end of the week or the month then they will start asking themselves i did so much i'm so exhausted but how come i feel like i'm not moving the needle yeah yeah it's true i i, I definitely <laughs> feel like that sometimes but i think like sometimes to-do list is also just as fulfilling i mean not mm. I, I, maybe not for like <laughs> white white collar style uh. jobs but like, you know, maybe when I'm cleaning my room or, mm. or, or like doing my, I don't know, doing the, how would I say, mechanical chores, like oh, I uh -huh. do my laundry uh, yeah. and, and stuff like that. Just that mm. taking off that bucket list of things yeah. is like pretty fulfilling, I would say. Yeah. If it's serving as a reminder for a very specific goal, and as you said, you're actually very clear on your objective. You know that you want to clean your room. It's just, okay, now I have all these things that I need to remember yes. to do. Um. Yeah, then then it works within that certain context. Yeah, got it. So, which which <laughs> which is a nice segue to the next question because, unfortunately, even if we are the masters of mm. separating what is necessary work yeah. versus what is busy work, mm. sometimes you know when we are in a company or an organization, yeah. you know our managers or our mm. bosses, immediate bosses, <laughs> classify busy work as necessary work. So. Uh, I'm, I'm, mm. I'm curious as how you would suggest people navigate through those yeah, yeah I mean because we can't tell mm. the boss hey I'm sorry yeah, this, is, <laughs> this is not this is not busy work so, uh, this, is not, this is not necessary yeah. work yeah I think fir first thing is to understand holistically right what's really on your plate so not just seeing that additional one pass as a okay I need to deal with this now but rather what else do I have on it on my plate and how does this new piece fit in, right? So some of it you may be able to kind of uh, reason it yourself, but it's always a useful segue to then check with your boss and say, hey, you know, I appreciate that uh, we have to do this piece. Um, however, I'm also working on some of these other stuff. So it would be helpful to get some clarification as to, I guess, how urgent is this one compared to the other ones? Because sometimes um, when a piece of work comes in, the natural instinct is let's just get it done, let's put it on the list yeah. and let's just um, rush through it. But sometimes I think taking a, a pause and asking yourself like how does it kind of help the team or you know help your department or function, I think that gives you an additional perspective on, okay, really is this how important and how does it contribute? Then it makes the, the piece of um, 
work when done well very more impactful got it mm. so to really prioritize the most important mm. versus the least and then checking with your boss yeah i would say constant clarification and um uh, check-ins are helpful because one thing we are very accustomed to doing is making assumptions mm-hmm. so i try not to make assumptions very possible i think it's just it takes an extra couple of seconds to say, hey, you know, just to confirm for this piece, right, we'll proceed in this direction and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. You must be the top 1% because uh, the rest of us, 99% uh-huh. always just assume. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but uh, and, and just to add further, mm. um, as, as a, uh, naturally, you know, especially when you work between departments, mm. for example, yeah. Um, I would say priorities differ. Yes. Someone's someone would consider a particular task more important to them yes which involves the both of you versus mm. you yeah um would you have any recommendations on how we can kind of work <laughs> together to yeah yeah so always have catch up meetings um to align the importance to the both of you right because the fact that the two sides will have to collaborate means that there's definitely input required on both ends right so in order for you to then prioritize the work that just come in, it's always helpful to clarify, you know, how will my piece help in this project and this task? And um, if I'm unable to meet this timeline, how does it impact your project? So that you get a better understanding as well as to what is needed and why your contribution is important. And that helps you then prioritize which is the one that you want to do. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's I guess it's easier in theory than because yeah. uh, we have to 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 debate them sometimes. I feel yeah, yeah. Of course, both we all have enough on our plate already. Yeah. Um. But I think sometimes finding finding that common ground gives you that motivation to move forward. Also, because the last thing you want is to yes, you got it done, but the quality is poor. Then it requires a lot of rework, more back and forth, and probably some unhappiness right. between the two parties. Also, yeah. Got it. And so moving moving away from the the differentiation or the differences mm. between necessary work and busy work, uh, I want to talk about us as individuals. Mm. You know, sometimes we have like this ultimate goal that we're trying mm-hmm. to achieve, right? Yeah. And we're really passionate about it. Mm. But oftentimes, you know, we are in our own way. Yeah. And <laughs> I think I think you as a as a coach in you you've developed systems to help us kind of identify the things that get in our way. So I was wondering mm. if you could also share with us how can we start to at least have an idea of what's standing in our own way or how we are standing in our own way. <laughs> yeah, I have found that most of the times it's actually our we ourselves are standing in our own way. And I'll give you an example. So it's always good to have a big goal and big vision. We all have. I'm sure every one of us we have. But the challenge then is, where do I start? Because sometimes the, when the goal is so big, you, you suddenly feel so overwhelmed. You're like, oh, actually, it's probably a lot bigger than I can deal with. Yeah. And let me just procrastinate because I know that doing this small thing today is not going to help. But it does help. Right. Because, I mean, Rome wasn't built in a day, right? As cliche as that one sounds. Yeah. Um, it's back to why do you want to, like how important is that big goal? And my approach is that I like to understand each individual as an individual. So really understand at the personality level, right? And then the mindset. Because I believe that it's very difficult, it's not difficult, but it takes more time to completely overhaul a personality and turn you to a different person, which is not my approach. Yeah. But I find that beha- behavioral adjustments can be made if you really want what you say you want. Because right. a lot of times we say we want something, but our actions are like completely opposite. Right. Um, so the common one is definitely um, being too overwhelmed to start. Number two is we think we know everything. We don't want to ask for help. And I see that a lot in high performance, which is the group that I work with. Yeah. I know everything, right? I've been able to figure everything out already. And let me just try to fix it or try to make steps forward. But I think do recognize that different people have different experiences and have trial and error. So it's, 
the better way to leverage on other people's insights. And even if you don't necessarily agree, but it's just an additional perspective that at least you can consider it holistically before you then you know make that choice of what you actually want to take on and which are the ones you say, okay, maybe it's not for me now and then I just discard. Yeah. Yeah. Why why do you think that people are reluctant to ask for help? Mm, maybe it's it's a certain ego, um, especially the really smart ones. Um, because for high performing executives or entrepreneurs, normally in their circle of friends, they are probably like the the one that most of their friends look up to. So sometimes, you know, an admission that you know you don't know something almost feels like I can't break this <laughs> this vision or facade that people have of me that, you know, I know everything and I always have the answers. But we all don't have every answer. Because you can be a specialist in one area and can be very good at it. But in other areas, there's someone else that may have more experience than us, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, and I think that's true even for me. I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't consider, classify myself as smart, but it's, mm. at the same time, I always find it difficult to, to ask for help. Mm. Specifically, maybe in the work environment. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, when I ask for help, sometimes I feel like... The, um, people will see it as inadequate and it might affect, yeah. you know, mm. like my chances within, mm. you know, a given organization. Yeah. So I think it's, I think also more than ego for me personally, mm. it's also that level yeah. of insecurity. Yeah. I think the the overthinking and insecurity definitely plays a part. But I guess the question is this, right? Asking now, gets you the clarification, allows you to move forward in the right direction rather than we make assumptions just because we are afraid of being judged, which is a very common one. And you take certain actions and one month down the road, you realize that all the effort was for nothing. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's so true. And yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've experienced that firsthand. <laughs> and, 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 I think, and I think what's worse, to, what's worse is mm. when... After it, after it all blows <laughs> blows up in your face, uh, someone just asks, "Why didn't you just ask me?" And yeah. you're like, "Yeah, why didn't I?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's true. It's the ego. It's the insecurity. Yeah, but apart from from, you know, being afraid to ask for mm. help, and maybe just that feeling of overwhelm. Yeah, are there any other things that you know are actually preventing us or are, are preventing us from actually reaching our goals? Mm. Yeah, it depends on, of course, how big your goal is and the details around that. Um, but I will always say, start by understanding yourself well. So your personality, what are your preferences? Because just by knowing your personality, um, there are certain things that you're more inclined to do and there are some others that may feel more difficult because you, you start to see that it is a challenge in your work or life. So I'll give you an example, something that I'm very passionate about is the difference between introverts and extroverts. So as an extrovert, right, you tend, you would um, want to engage with people, life of the party, chit chat and whatnot. But that's great for making connections, networking events, right? But what is the inherent challenge of being an extrovert? You don't listen. You don't listen. You don't focus. And the other thing is that you you speak before you think, which sometimes is very detrimental in a corporate environment or even in business. Right. Right. So that's that's very inherent in a personality. But you must first understand this is how you are. It's nothing right or wrong because we all have a natural preference to something. But gaining that awareness then allows you to identify, huh, I actually I, I have the tendency of doing this. So let me now make behavioral adjustments to make sure that I try to balance this, what I call the default habits that I have yeah. so that I can be more effective either at work or in business. So on the flip side, as an introvert, most of the time they are quieter. Maybe they are unable to respond so quickly. So they may be in the meeting. The idea comes to them like maybe after the meeting, right? right? right. But during the meeting, they're so quiet. People think that, oh, you're, you're not contributing. Why are you not adding value? You have nothing to say. But maybe they just need a bit more time to process. And that's not always a bad thing. But perception-wise may not be seen as a good thing. Yeah. So in such instances, may need to learn some, what I call giving holding statements, right? So being able to summarize, but 
offer yourself a leeway, uh, an exit plan to say, okay, this is kind of what I think. Um, but let me get back to you on email should I have any other suggestions. Yeah, so it's knowing your strengths and weakness, but also a certain method to try to overcome and manage. I call manage that kryptonite right. so that it doesn't blow up in your face like you earlier said. Yeah. How do you how do you identify those weaknesses? Well, should, should I be calling them weaknesses or just how do I identify those characteristics mm. that might be hindering me? Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of um, personality tests out there. Um, DISC, Myers-Briggs, Instagram. So I think uh, making an effort to fill up some of those are helpful. And speak to your friends. Your friends know you better than you think they know you sometimes. So yeah. you have you know, five to ten friends you, um, or colleagues that you spend time with. I mean, just ask them, what do you think I do that I'm very good at? What do you think some of the things that I could improve on? You know, just like a casual sort of survey thing. Yeah. Um, and then ask yourself, right, does whatever they say resonate with you? Because you'll be surprised that you might learn something about yourself. Yeah. Right. Interesting. Yeah, I, yeah, I suppose now that you think of it, uh, and now that you mention <laughs> it, 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 it's true. I mean, I, I I can't say too much about the personality mm-hmm. test because even when I go through the personality yeah. test, um, they don't phrase it in negative ways. So you, I, I, I can't tell if it's a good or bad thing. I just know <laughs> like, hey, you know, like uh, I'm an introvert, introvert mm-hmm. I get my energy yeah. by being alone, etc. So yeah. there's, there's no, it doesn't, it's not immediately obvious yeah. that this is a problem yeah but when my friends do tell me mm. like you know or, or not really fr- where well, your yeah, friends and mm. then colleagues say you know hey, maybe you should speak up in the mm. office and stuff then yeah. you know you notice like okay yeah this is something i should yeah. be focusing so definitely on. don't take the results at just face value but i always a belie- i'm a huge believer in like applied wisdom and practical wisdom because knowledge for not I mean, knowledge is power. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's partially true, but applied knowledge is very powerful. What is applied wisdom, by the way? How, what does that mean? So how, how does that apply? How can you apply what you've learned into real life and make that linkage and continue to improve from there? Got it. Yeah. Because learning for learning's sake is, is good, yeah. um, but does not necessarily help your life in a way that um, can make the most impact. Got mm-hmm. it. Right. So, we if we if we identify the things that are holding us back, yeah, and we kind of know how to deal with those things mm. and 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 create a goal that's or or we are aware of a good goal for us. Mm. How what is a what is a good way to measure what a good goal is, and then after that, how do we measure its success? Yeah. I think goal set setting is you know as old as the whatever itself. Um, I think don't try to have specific goals. So something that if you can make it more tangible, then that's likely you know you have achieved it or not. So I'll give you an example. A lot of people say, "I want to become a good leader." Well, let me ask you, what is a good leader to you? Mm-hmm. So if you set a goal saying that, "Okay, I'm going to become a good leader," I'm like. Okay, so what does that mean? Does that mean that you want to engage better with your team? Um, or does that mean that you don't want to have backlogs in your work? You want to um, get more buy-ins from your stakeholder? You want to have more amicable meetings? It is very hard to quantify and know if you have achieved the goal if it's very high level. And if a goal is so high level, you're unable to break it down and then tag, tag in what are the skills that you need to develop to get to that goal got it i um don't mean to interrupt yeah, you um so do you mean don't set high level goals or set high level goals but then bring it down and make create measurable objectives from there um you can have a big vision but the nature of goals itself right meaning it needs to be specific and measurable right yeah yeah right okay so vision Vision and goals are just be separated. Essentially. Yes, there's, there's a difference. So, for example, the vision could be I want to be the top performer in this company. I want to have a five-star rating, right? And the goal, the goal can be I want to um, receive positive feedback from 
three key stakeholders. I want to be able to run my meetings and complete on time or something like that. Yeah. Because otherwise, how do you know whether you have achieved them or not? Right. It's very tricky, isn't it? Yeah, I suppose <laughs> it's... Yeah. It's, it, it, is, it is interesting though because, for example, like the... Um, Let's use the mm. the example of a leader. Yeah. I want to be a better leader. Mm. Now, how we decide to measure it doesn't necessarily mean that we are actually measuring it in the right way that 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 identifies as a good leader, right? So for mm -hmm. example, let's say, you know, I want to um clear my backlog, etc. Mm -hmm. or or make sure my team is on tasks. I mean, mm -hmm. these are all our definitions of a good leader. So does it matter if it's just our definition? Well, if it's your own definition, you'll feel more relate. I mean, you can relate that uh, to it better and then you'll be more motivated. But I think if you, are, you happen to be a new leader or new manager, definitely get some feedback for more experienced managers who can give you, or leaders who can give you a bit more um, suggestions on maybe these are some skills that you might want to look to develop as well um because yes it's back to you know we need to ask for help right, right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. and may maybe we can uh if you don't mind we can yeah. like use your past experience mm -hmm. as, a, as an example yeah um you know how did you identify the things in your life that were getting in your own way mm. and 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 what were things you what were the things you did to try to rectify it? Yeah. Um, I think the, the biggest thing I noticed um, in terms of, I guess, my personal limitations was uh, when I joined an international bank. Um, so as you know, in Singapore, a lot of the management level are Westerners and right. the, a lot of the, uh, I guess, the Asians are sort of a mid-managerial um, level. So when I first joined, I looked so young. So when I followed my bosses, you still look young, oh, thank way. you. <laughs> uh, so when I followed my bosses to meetings, a lot of times people thought I was his secretary. Some people thought I was there to take notes and like you know I was the I was the calendar lady, um, and so forth. I think that really impacted my confidence. I'm like, oh, what what is happening and why is this happening? So definitely, there's a lot of time ruminating and reflecting of like, oh, is this my fault? And maybe I need to work harder. I need to do this and do that. So, but you see, the keyword is this: I went into doing instead of becoming the person or what's, the, what's the confidence. The right? If you could explain that. So, doing is you believe by just taking certain actions, you can become more comp competent. But deep down inside, you're not. You don't. You know, you're not at that level. You feel like you. You constantly have to prove yourself by doing more and more. But I think be becoming is accepting that okay, this is my new role now, right? And in order for me to be successful, what are the skills that I need and how should I communicate and how should I, I manage so that I can then get that respect? Not by, okay, I need to do 10,000 things. Then people will know that they have to listen to me. I think that there is a, there is a difference in that. Right. Yeah. I, and I think you brought up a good point that I want to, to focus on and that's like, the confidence aspect mm. of it you know where whether it's failure or in your case maybe being mistaken for mm. uh something that you're not you know <laughs> something you feel like um, doesn't represent who well yeah. definitely doesn't <laughs> represent who you are um when those when your confidence is shaken what mm. did you do to build that back up again yeah i found it very helpful to have a um, one on one conversation with um my superior or my boss at that time um, just to make sure that I am I myself are, I am very clear on what I need to deliver and really the value that I can bring so I think having that internal alignment is very helpful um, because we need to work as a team in most instances right so rather than me ruminating trying to figure it out on my own I had that one-on-one -on -one conversation I got a better understanding of okay what am I here to do Yes, these are maybe noise for now, but how can I do better? Then for me, I tied it to skill set. Because I believe that if you are competent and you know that deep down, you know that you're very good at what you're doing, the confidence does shine through. 
right? right? And it is visible. And when people talk to you, you speak with a certain conviction and confidence that people know that, okay, you know, actually what she's saying is legit, right? Yeah. This is how we're going to work together and whatnot. Yeah. So right. I found that helpful. Oh, that's good. Yeah. And um, confidence is, uh, and, and the reason why I mm. ask is because, uh, well, I guess I can, to be fair, I can mm. share my own experience as well. Yeah. So, yeah, I suffered from uh, clinical depression mm. for about 10 years plus. Yeah. And I always, and I remember towards the tail end, right? Mm. Um, because, you know, my confidence was not high, you know, mm. because I felt inadequate or, yeah. or just less of a person than mm. a, a regular person, for example. Um, I would always use my depression as an example, as mm. a reason to not do something. Yeah. You know what I mean? So for example, like uh, if there's an event or mm-hmm. a networking yeah. type event, I'll be like, uh, I would almost cycle myself into saying, oh, I'm depressed. So I, I'm yeah, not going to yeah. go for this. But in reality, I was just not confident anymore with myself. Yeah. So I didn't go. And I mm. think that for me was an example yeah. of getting in my own way because I chose to use it as a crutch instead of realizing that I was just using using it as an excuse yeah it's just fear because um you know humans we are we are creature of habit right so when you're in a new situation they have to do something new our natural reaction is that oh yeah maybe not for me yeah (laughs) right right (laughs) Right? so then you're like okay uh, maybe not maybe this and that and all sorts of like other excuses like so but I think Feel the fear, but do it anyway. Sometimes it's just that first step. And what what is also very funny, and I can share with you. So this year, 1st January, I told myself that I will produce video content on LinkedIn. Yeah. And, and previously, you know, I'm quite an introverted person and I don't really like to get out there. I mainly do a lot of back-end work. <laughs> um, so it was, it was very scary for sure. But I think that it's about... Just get it out there. If you look at my first video, it was, yeah, I'm not proud of it, but <laughs> I'm proud that I actually posted it. Yeah. Um, but you, you grow stronger and stronger from there. Well, mm. Sometimes it's just taking the first step and a lot of people cycle themselves. They say, oh, I can't do it. And, and then they're comparing themselves with other people who have been doing it for years. Yeah. So you're at level one, you're comparing someone who's like at level 99, then, then that's where you feel, oh, maybe, maybe not for me, right? Yeah. yeah. Did you do that? Did you compare yourself with others who are doing it better than you? I mean, for some, I mean, that's the nature of social media, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, so you tend to kind of look around and say, oh, these people are doing videos and they, yeah. they look so good. And like, my mind is going to be lousy. I don't have subtitles. I don't have this and don't have that. But ultimately, I just decided that um, if I want to create a brand that can resonate with people and for myself to connect with people, I think that I need, I can't hide behind yeah. a, a, a website or a, a profile page. I mean, I want to connect with people and I told myself that, you know what, just baby steps. Today is one video is a win. Yeah. The next one, maybe a two minute video is a win. Then yeah. the next one, maybe, you know, if I if I don't stutter, that's a win. Yeah. And then the later on, okay, maybe if I can add little subtitles here and there, the color looks better and stuff like <laughs> that. So I think it's just setting like little daily wins, that little improvements that you can do rather than looking outside and looking at the the shiny um shine next shiny thing and try to try to aspire to be that one yeah yeah, yeah and sometimes it can be challenging when you see all mm. these people getting like thousands of likes yes. and, and and stuff and you know <laughs> you just get you know one <laughs> one like or one share and you're like oh yeah. am i doing it right i mean yeah. clearly no one did it which alludes to the point that you brought up mm. earlier, which is your the reason why you're doing it and your purpose. Mm. Because for me, you know, like this podcast mm. and Echo Academy in general yeah. was is is I suppose is my way of paying it forward mm. because of all the people who have helped me overcome yeah. my mental health issues. Mm. And even though this is not career <laughs> has nothing really <laughs> it doesn't directly have anything to do with mental health. Yeah. I always feel like the challenges in the workplace mm. can be a trigger for your mental well-being. And yeah. so for me, like knowing why I was doing this was very mm. important because now I don't really care about the likes and, yeah. and stuff. Like I'm just doing like, to, yeah. how can I improve myself? How can I produce yes. better content? Yeah. But at the start, it was a bit hard, I mm. would say. Yeah. I, mean, oh, I guess away from the the number of likes and whatnot, I think the more interesting question to ask is 
that person who liked, even if it's that one person, that person resonated with your message. So it's better to get that kind of, um, I guess, of a feedback of someone actually got the value from what you produce rather than so many more. Because it all starts with one person. Yeah. Yeah. And I want I want to have a end of question that mm-hmm. I think is both personal to you, but I think could be relevant to our listeners as well. Mm-hmm. And that is, what was one? I mean, you 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 kind of mentioned it already, yeah. but I think I just want to expand on mm-hmm. it. What was one thing that was, you know, standing in your own way? I mean, what what? Yeah, what was one thing that was a personal challenge for you mm. that when you were younger at least? Yeah. And what do you think you could have done differently to solve that problem knowing what you know now as a coach and mm. many years in the workforce? Yeah. Um, I wish I was more courageous. Because when I was younger, I was highly introverted. So I didn't feel like I was like the other children who would then go around playground and take photos and I always didn't really want to do any of that. And I feel like at that point, of course, you know, every parent would want their kid to mix with other children, right? So I felt like I was I was not very normal. Um, yeah, I, I think if that time I just saw it as, you know what, it doesn't really change who I am. It's just, just making one new connection a day. I think that would have been helpful. And I think that pattern has it's also reflected in my career as well. So when I connect with people, I don't necessarily go out of my way to try to get to know people. It's more like I wait for people to come to me because that's how I've behaved since I was a lot younger. Um, yeah, so I wish that I was just more courageous and say, you know what, like, I really want to collaborate or work with you. And yeah, I mean, let's just talk about it. Yeah. yeah. What, what do you think being more courageous when you were younger mm. would have meant to you? I mean, what what difference would it have made, do you think? Um, maybe it could have given me more opportunities. Um, but also, I think, knowing more people. Yeah, connecting with more people. Right. Yeah. And, and uh, in one of my earlier episodes, <laughs> I spoke to uh, a friend of mine, Alison. Mm. Uh, Alison was, um, I mean... I mean, the topic was really around relocation and relocating yeah. to a new country. And the question I asked her, <laughs> the last question I asked her was, what would the Alison of um, mm. today advise the Alison of, you know, yeah. yesteryear in terms of, you know, well, any advice based on her experience yeah. now? And she said something that I think has stuck with me because she mm. said I would actually turn that thing or turn that question around and yeah. say, what would the Alison of yesteryear tell the Alison of of now? Because mm. she says that her younger self was more fearless. And mm. because she took those, you know, like she was more courageous mm-hmm. and she yeah. was she took those exp- experiences and chances and mm. opportunities that came her way that yeah. she became who she was today. Mm. And I thought that was really good because as we get older, actually yes. we get a bit more fearful and we are more mm. risk averse. Yeah. And I think that's a good reminder. Yeah. I, I found that quite the opposite for me because I think being a highly introverted person and my professional degree is an accountant. I'm an accountant. So <laughs> naturally people are more risk averse. So I felt like it was a bit opposite for me. I feel like I've become more courageous as I've grown older. That's good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think, uh, it, uh, but I think, I mean, the the moral yeah. of what I was trying to say mm. is that I think if 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 nothing else, mm. like if we didn't have any experience, if mm. we didn't have any friends, if we yeah. didn't have you know all <laughs> these things going for us, at mm. the end of the day, as long as we are fearless yes. and have a bit more courage, yes. the opportunities will still come. Yes. Yeah, and, and I and I I don't know. I it it just stuck with me, and I always I yeah. always find it like it's a reminder every time I'm a bit scared, you know. Yes, yes. I just completely scared. agree. And I mean, the last thing I'll leave you is leave you to is um, if you are not, I mean, if you are afraid and you you don't get out there, then how can opportunities find you? Absolutely. Because you need to be found, right? Exactly. <laughs> and 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 on the topic of you need to be found. 
I would love to give you a chance to 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 share with the listeners what you do and uh, mm. how you can help them and how they can reach you. Yeah, sure. So I'm very passionate about working with young people, um, specifically um, young high performers. So I really believe that the skills for the future is no longer the technical hard skills, but it's the soft skills, knowing how to process problems, how to navigate complex issues, how to manage people, how to have more self-awareness because the I believe the job market and business for the future will turn into a skills-based economy. So it's really learning about who you are and how you can um, best add value. And by learning all these little skills that I don't really see a lot of courses out there that are teaching you and the value that I bring when I work with my clients that I have been there, done that. So in my 10 years of corporate career, I was the senior director at Standard Chartered before I left. And now I'm coaching because I believe that coaching changes lives. And I love one-on-one transformation. I think that's actually impactful because that one person learning all these skills that can impact their business, life or career will go out there and make life better for someone else. So it all starts with that one person. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I can be found on LinkedIn. So, I mean, if you're interested, please just connect with me on LinkedIn. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll, put, your, and I'll put your contact details mm. in, in our um, uh, podcast description. So yeah, it'll sure. be easy enough to find you. Mm. Uh, Meiping, thank you so much for being on this podcast. Yeah, thanks for helpful. having me. And uh, cheers to being more courageous. Yeah, huh? cheers, cheers. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you.